Well, I think it's time to get started. I don't know if everybody's here, but I'm here. You're all here. Thank you for being here. It's good to be here. So uh, let's talk about sequences some more. Um, we don't have all that much more to say about sequences, actually. We're going to move on to something different soon enough. But uh, for now, let's talk a little bit more about sequences. We had this theorem a couple times ago. It says if a sequence converges, then it must be bounded. That's because if something converges, it means uh, eventually the sequence is all going to be like really close to some particular number. And whatever it did before it got around that particular number was only finitely many steps. And so there has to be sort of a biggest number overall and the smallest, or at least maybe it's increasing up to its limit. But anyway, it must be bounded in that case, all right? What I would like to talk about today is something about the converse. Is the converse of that true? The converse of a if then, remember, is when you read it just in the other order. So if P then Q, the converse is if Q then P. So the converse would mean, uh, I'll put this sort of in quotes here, because we're not sure if it's true or not. Um, if A N is bounded, then uh, AN converges. What do you think? Does that sound true to anybody? Or do you think that's not true? If it is bounded, then it converges. I see some head shaking out there. What do you say? So 1 over n is bounded. Yeah, that doesn't sound like a sequence to me. 1 over n as a sequence is bounded and it converges to 0, right, when the n uh, becomes infinite. Well, something else you said sounded good. Any other ideas? Actually, it's not true. So the answer is the converse true? The answer is no. It's possible to have a bounded sequence which does not converge. Um, can we think of an example? A sequence which does not converge but is bounded. Actually, we've only done maybe a couple, we only talked about a couple of specific examples that do not converge. Although I think I remember talking about one that even though it does not converge, it is bounded. ideas. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll refresh your memory. Um, a sequence which does not converge. We talked about one example. How about um, minus 1 to the power n, right? This equals negative 1, then 1, then negative 1, then 1. This is bounded, I hope you would agree. The values don't go you know, out to infinity or anything like that. But it does not converge, right? That's because there is no specific number such that all of these values eventually get close to that number, right? Uh, you might feel like, well, it kind of converges to one and also to minus one because it equals one infinitely many times and minus one infinitely many times. Uh, I know what you're thinking, but it, that doesn't count as convergence. In order for it to converge, for instance, to 1, all the values eventually have to get really close to 1, and they don't. Okay, anyway, this is bounded, though, right? Because all of these uh, values are less than or equal to 1 in absolute value, but diverges. Okay? Um, what we're going to talk about today, though, is a type of theorem that says if it's bounded, then it's convergent. Uh, then it converges. So the only reason like this is possible, it is because it uh, oscillates, right? 
like the value sometimes gets bigger, sometimes gets smaller. And this allows it to never converge, even though it's still bounded, right? This is how you can have a sequence which is bounded but doesn't converge, is if it, it jumps around, its value goes up sometimes, goes down sometimes. What our big uh, theorem for the day is going to say is that if there's no oscillation, then bounded implies that it converges. So that's uh, the, uh, the big, this is like a big name theorem actually, and it's even in the, uh, such a big name, it's in the course description that we saw on the, like on the syllabus. We're talking about, this is called the monotone convergence theorem. And the idea is, it says, if your sequence doesn't do this bouncing back and forth thing, but it, it either always increases from term to term, or it always decreases from term to term, no, no jumping around. If that's true, and it's bounded, then it converges. That's what the theorem says. So this word monotone refers to that thing about it doesn't bounce around. It either goes, increases all the time, or decreases all the time. So that's, I'm, I'm just gonna write that as a definition. Um, we say that a sequence AN is called increasing if uh, AN is less than or equal to AN plus one for all N, right? That's what, this is not rocket science, this is what you would think in the word increasing means. Uh, and decreasing means what you think it means if a n is greater than or equal to a n plus one for all n. So increasing just means the numbers are getting bigger every time, decreasing means they're getting smaller every time. Uh, and any sequence which is either of those things, there's a name for that. So if a n is increasing or decreasing, then we say a n is monotone. And the word monotone is meant to uh, have the connotation of like, it's doing the same thing every time. Either it's going up every time or it's going down every time, but it doesn't switch back and forth, all right? Either purely increasing or purely decreasing, it's called monotone. And the monotone convergence theorem, which is our big topic for the day, so I'll write the theorem here. And it says what, what I already said. Um, this is called the monotone convergence theorem. It says if a n is monotone, that is either it's always increasing or it's always decreasing. If a n is monotone and bounded, then it converges. This is the monotone convergence theorem. It's a good name for it, I think. It sort of tells you what, what it is. The only word missing is bounded from the name of the theorem. It's really about monotone and bounded sequences. If it's monotone and bounded, then it converges. Interesting fact about this is, this is, uh, at least so far in this class, um, this is the only way to show something converges if you don't know what the limit is. Only way to show that a sequence converges without knowing the limit. I don't mean this is like the only way ever, I just mean so far, uh, as far as what we've talked about so far. If you wanna show something converges, you have to do that whole epsilon thing. And you need to know at the very beginning what the limit is in order to write those proofs, right? I'm sure you've noticed. If you don't know what the limit is, then really you have no way of even starting uh, to use the definition of convergence. Okay, so uh, interest, that's something interesting about the monotone convergence theorem. It is a way to show that something converges even if you don't know what the limit is. All right. Um, great, I would like to talk about why this is true. I don't think we need to go through a super detailed proof because the idea of the proof Let's just do like proof idea. I'm not sure if you all feel like we've been doing too many proofs so far, not enough proofs. I don't know, I'm, st I'm still trying to get a feel for it myself. Uh, this is the first time I've taught this course, although I taught the, um, 
I taught the real analysis for the master's program. So over there, I'm used to doing a proof for everything. And I don't know if you guys are into that, but that's all right. I'm going to pretend like you're into it, uh, even though I do know your heart in some sense, I think. Um, anyway, let's talk about the idea of the proof. So the idea, really the hard part, is just deciding what the limit is when you don't know what the limit is. Um, I'm going to see if, let's see if we're going to sort of draw a little picture here that will help us to sort of get a handle on what the limit might be. So the idea here is, well, let's, let's just assume for the sake of this proof that a n is increasing. Actually, even if I was going to write out all the details, I would still just, you basically prove it once if it's increasing and then you write the same proof again if it's decreasing, you just change all the inequality directions. So let's just talk about increasing for now. Now, the fact that a n is bounded means there's some big number m where the terms just never go above this point, all right? So all the terms of the sequence are to the left of the upper bound, which I'll call m. And it's an increasing sequence. That means, like, if I put a1 here, a2 has to be to the right of that because it's increasing, right? So maybe a2 is here. a3 has to be to the right of that. Maybe it's up here. They don't have to be getting closer together, at least not at, not at first, although you can see they're going to start piling up. If you you got to go to the right every time, but you can't pass the M. So um, eventually, you know, they have to build up. Now, they might build up all the way up to N, or they might just sort of build up somewhere else, right? It just has to be to the left or, or equal to M, perhaps, okay? So maybe that's A4, A5, etc. That's what they have to look like. And actually, I can see by looking at the picture, if you ask me to like point with my finger, where is the limit of the sequence? Can you point with your finger? It's, it's like right there, right? Um, but how are you gonna get a handle on what exactly that value is? Like, can we um, s describe that point sort of mathematically uh, rather than just pointing our finger at it? Um, here's, here's the trick or the, the basic idea here is to think of the sequence a n as just as a set of points just temporarily. Think of it as a set, not, not really thinking of these points as going in some order, although we know that they do. What if I just think of this as a set? It looks like these points, right? And eventually they sort of cluster up like that. Actually, as a set, we have a name for this point. At the end there. Anybody uh, know what I'm thinking of? This is something that we spent a good amount of time talking about. Yeah. It is the soup. Yeah. That point, whatever the limit is, it must be the soup of that set. Excellent. So this point is the supremum. Even said it. A full word. On a street, we say soup, but you can say supremum if you want. All right? Yeah, that is the soup. Uh, so that's this is kind of the basic observation which allows you to, uh, to do the proof. In order to do the proof, you need to figure out ahead of time what the limit is. And the limit in this case must be the soup. So uh, can we just justify why is uh, the soup, let's, let's call this, I'll call it S just temporarily. Why is S the limit? Well, to show, to explain that it's the limit, you have to demonstrate that beyond a certain point in the sequence, all the points are near S, right? So I would like to think about, now I'm gonna draw S here. And let's just think about this like in terms of neighborhoods, right? These points, because S is the soup, it means the points go like that. Oh no, I turned the page. That turn the page button is right under where my hand goes. Okay, and then I'm gonna think of like a little neighborhood around S, right? This right here is what we call V epsilon of S, the epsilon neighborhood around S. Is it true that eventually all the points will be inside this neighborhood? I mean, it certainly looks like that on the picture. It seems to be true. Um, how do you know that really all of them will be inside there? Well, we can say that, um, 
how many, how about this? We can say, we know that at least some of the AN will be inside the neighborhood. Uh, because if there were no terms of the sequence inside the neighborhood, then S would not be the soup, right? Then you could make S smaller and it would still be an upper bound. S is supposed to be the least upper bound. And so that means we know that some of the AN will be inside the neighborhood. I'll just say, or else S is not the least upper bound. Right? If, the, if none of those points were inside the neighborhood, you could push S to the left a little bit and it would still be upper bound. And that's not allowed because S is the soup. Okay, so some of them, so that means that there is some particular one which is in the neighborhood. But then this means all the others have to be because the points always move to the right. They never go back to the left. And so each subsequent one is also going to be part of that neighborhood. And it's not going to overshoot the neighborhood to the right because S is the upper bound. So. So that means there is some particular AN which is in the neighborhood. And then since AN is increasing, all subsequent values will be to the right, which means they're also going to be inside the neighborhood. They're going to be to the right of AN, but still to the left of S. So since AN is increasing, all further values are inside the neighborhood also, or I'll say terms. All further terms still inside the epsilon of s. All right, and that, that's what we need to, uh, to demonstrate that um, s is the limit. All right, I kind of did the proof. This is, uh, this is the idea. I didn't write out every single detail. All right, so this is the monotone convergence theorem. Um, I said you can find, you can prove that something converges without knowing what the limit is. Well, I mean, if you believe the proof, which I hope you do, actually you do know that the limit is the soup of the sequence, although the soup is sometimes very difficult to, uh, to compute if you really wanted to. All right. I wanted to do some examples. Sorry, I lost one of my pages. Okay. I, all right. It's there. Um, I thought, this is something that I, I intend to do throughout the class, um, throughout the semester. Um, one of the examples that I want to do for this section is featured on the 2020 comprehensive exam. You all know about the comprehensive exam, right? This is the big, no, this is, if you're a math major, you're going to know. Uh, all, all math majors must take the senior comprehensive exam as a graduation requirement. Uh, it happens in January of your senior year. January, usually like the last week of January. And it, uh, it is your opportunity, your chance, to demonstrate your knowledge of all the major math uh, topics. There are six sections. There's calculus, uh, discrete math, linear algebra, real analysis, abstract algebra. What did I leave out? Or are there only five sections? Maybe that's it. Maybe there's only five. I don't know. Um, anyway, one of the sections is real analysis. And um, since you all are going to take the comprehensive exam soon enough, I thought maybe whenever possible, I'm going to uh, show you, you know, problems that have a appeared on that exam. So this is an example of showing that a sequence converges even when you don't know what the limit is. Um, and I will... So here's the question. It says... Define a sequence by, this is a weird definition of a sequence, x1 equals 1, and the other terms, xn equals square root of 2 plus, sorry, xn plus 1 equals square root of 2 plus xn, like that. So this is the definition of the sequence. This is called a recursive definition of the sequence because they tell you the first value, but then all the other values are defined in terms of other of the values, right? Uh, by the way, sometime, uh, if you're a senior now, you should be, fairly soon you will get a copy of the 2019 and the 2020 comprehensive exam. So you, this is not a secret that I'm telling you this question. Um, so this is the definition of a sequence, all right? And it says, 
trying to write it just the way it appears in the exam. Okay, part A says, this is an easy one. State the monotone convergence theorem. Okay, my answer is, if a n is bounded and monotone, monotone, then a n converges. All right. In my opinion, the uh, comprehensive exam questions are not that hard. Uh, what's hard about it is just the fact that you have to go to the exam being ready to answer any question about anything. Um, on the day that we talk about the monotone convergence theorem, you should feel like the question about the monotone convergence theorem isn't really that hard. It's just, can you, um, can you remember what we're talking about right now uh, when it comes down to take the test and while remembering everything else? That's the hard thing. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the first part. If AN is bounded and monotone, then AN converges. Okay, part B is, um, this is also easy. Write the first four terms of the sequence. And you are allowed to use a calculator on the comprehensive exam, although you won't use it very often. But um, this is one time when uh, you might want to use your calculator to do this. But anyway, write the first four terms. OK. Someone tell me, what is x1? One. one. Yeah, that's just part of the definition. How about x2? Uh, somebody said square root of 3. Yeah, you go root 2 plus x1, right? That's the definition of the sequence here. It says x whatever is always the square root of 2 plus and then the previous term. So in this example, uh, the previous term is x1, but we already computed that value as 1. We, we didn't compute it. it, just that's what it was. Okay, and then this is root 3, all right? which um, I'd, I would leave it like this if you were doing this on the conference end. But because of a part that's coming soon, I'm, I'm, I plug that into my calculator. It's that, all right? Okay, those are the first two. What about x3? What would this one look like? Square root of? 3.73, yeah, can, I'll write it like this. Two plus, oops, root three, right? You always do square root of two plus the previous value, and the previous value here was root three. This certainly, um, if you wanna know what that value is, you will want to plug it into your calculator. 1.931, etc. Okay, and then x4 is the square root of two plus the previous term, which was that, right? And this I also put into my calculator, 1.982 something, all right? Like I said, on the exam itself, probably you would not, well, no, yeah, I would not have expected you to put them into your calculator. Um, okay, part C. Now here's a part which may seem a little hard to us just because we haven't done this in a while. Um, prove by induction. Remember that thing? That xn is increasing. All right. As far as proving things by induction, this is not a hard proof. But I mean, I, I don't know how much you guys remember proving things by induction. Let's see if we can do it. Prove by induction that xn is increasing. So first of all, you need to write down what, what it is exactly you want to show. So I want to show xn is increasing means xn less than or equal to xn plus 1, right? This is what I have to prove, and it said prove this by induction. Anyone remember how to do uh, proof by induction? You got to do two parts, right? The base case and the inductive case. I hope you remember this from your discrete math days. If not, I will refresh your memory. And remember how to do the base case? First, I'll write what I want to show. What would this look like in the base case? Yeah. Can you just take a number and show that it works? Yeah, it works for a particular number. Actually, you don't choose any number you like. You gotta, 
you would start with the first number, usually one or maybe zero, depending on the context. In this problem, there, the smallest value for n uh, allowed is one. So I'm going to prove the statement as written is true when I use n equals one. So I'm going to say what I want to show is what, x1 less than or equal to x2. This is what needs to be shown for the base case. And the base case is usually very easy. And in this case, it is. x1 is 1, and x2 is uh, 1.73, blah, blah, blah. All right? So it is true that x1 is less than or equal to x2. There's not really anything to show there. I suppose right here you might have wanted your calculator, although everybody knows the square root of 3 is more than 1, right? Uh, all right. That's the base case. That's the easy part of the induction. And now we do the inductive case. Inductive case. This involves you assume something and then you got to prove something else. Anybody remember how we do this? What are you, what are you going to do for the uh, assumption? This is called the inductive hypothesis. Do you want to get fancy about it? Yeah. Yeah, you assume that the theorem is true when you use k, and then you have to prove that it's true when you use k plus 1. So this one may be slightly confusing because you already see a sort of a plus 1 in there, but I'm going to assume xk less than or equal to xk plus 1. That is, I just copied the underlined red thing, which is what I want to show, but I'm using k. That's my assumption, and then I want to show the same thing by using k plus 1 instead of n. So that would have k plus 1 on the left and k plus 2 on the right. Because, you know, you would go up, uh, up here, replacing n by k plus 1. On the left it will say k plus 1. On the right it will say k plus 1 plus 1, which is k plus 2. All right. Can we do this? Okay, this is what I want to show. Uh, I will start with the thing on the left and see if we can. I want to put like equal signs or less than or equal signs, eventually ending up with um, equals, possibly less than or equals, eventually ending up with x, k plus 2. Any suggestions about what we can do here? Well, the only thing really you can do is use the definition of the sequence, which is all the way up there at this point. But um, I have x, k plus 1 down here. And I can plug in the formula of the sequence up here with the square root. Do you have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't uh, paying attention to the hands. I denied you your... Yeah, I'm going to go not less than or equal. Equal, this is the definition of the sequence, square root 2 plus xk, right? That's the definition of the sequence. Now, I want to continue either simplifying or using inequalities, um, perhaps using the induction hypothesis. You, when you're doing proof by induction, you basically always have to use the induction hypothesis. Actually, right now, I can use the induction hypothesis, which is this thing, right? The blue thing. Anybody agree? What can I say with this, using the blue thing? Yeah. Right. So just replacing xk with xk plus 1, this is like the, the simplest thing you could think of doing if your intention is to use the induction hypothesis. And then what can I do with that? Square root of 2 plus k plus uh, 2 plus xk plus 1. Yeah. Yeah, this equals xk plus 2. That's the definition of the sequence again, right? It all just works out so great. And so, uh, in conclusion, you know, read this all the way across. xk plus 1 less than or equal to xk plus 2 as desired. All right. So that was part, part, part C of that uh, problem. Once you are hip to the idea of using induction, I think the, the, the uh, proof is not so difficult, just maybe a little rusty on the induction. Any questions about that? 
All right, I want you guys to try part D. So uh, uh, you can probably guess what part D is gonna ask. First, we said state the monotone convergence sequence. In part C, we proved that it is increasing. Remember what you need to use the monotone convergence theorem is it has to be monotone that is increasing or decreasing and bounded. So part D is gonna be prove that it's bounded. Now, actually, they don't say prove that it's bounded. If you were looking at these values, what might you guess that the upper bound would be? Two, two. yeah. In, in fact, it seems like maybe the sequence is actually converging to two, although this is not a whole lot of evidence, just the first four terms. But yeah, it is uh, bounded above by two. So part D is prove, but it's, it actually says in the question, whoa. Proof by induction, again, that's why I want you guys to try it, that xn is less than or equal to 2 for all n. All right, see if you can do it. Do the base case first, which uses n equal 1, and then see if you can use, uh, use the induction hypothesis in the part 2. I'll give you a few moments. All right, let's talk about this. It looks like people are doing pretty well. Everybody got the base case. The base case, what you need to show is just the same statement, only using n equals one. So what you need to show is just 
that uh, x1 is less than or equal to 2. But we were told that x1 equals 1, so yes, x1 is less than or equal to 2. For the induction case, anyone want to tell me, what did you say for the, um, the assumption, the induction hypothesis? What did you say? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. X k less than or equal to 2, right? Is that what you said? Yeah. X k less than or equal to 2. This is what you assume. And then what I want to prove, I want to show. What did you say for that? Somebody else shout it out. Yeah, x k plus 1 less than or equal to 2. All right. So, uh, you know, you don't have to have any real big idea. I would start by writing that thing, x k plus 1. And then what are you going to do with it? Well, inspired by what I did in the previous one, really the only thing you can do here is write out the definition of the sequence again, 2 plus xk. And then what did you do with that? Yeah. Yeah, replace the xk by 2. That is using the induction hypothesis, all right? And as if by some miracle, you get 2 there, right? And it all works out great. So x, k plus 1, less than or equal to 2. And that's what we wanted. All right, so this is part D. Any questions about that? Really, the only thing hard about this is that maybe you haven't done a lot of proof by induction lately. But the, the proof itself is not, not difficult. Okay, and then uh, there's a part E. Can you believe it? This problem, by the way, I looked, I was in charge of the comprehensive exam last year and, and a couple years before that. Um, so I, I looked back at, uh, you know, the exam has a lot of questions on it and you get to look at the questions and choose which ones you want to do. So there's typically ones that everybody thinks are too hard and nobody does them. This one, more than half of the people who took the test decided to do this problem. So um, I guess, People looking at this felt like this was a, an easy one. Or, or maybe it was just similar to one of the ones they had all been practicing. All right. Anyway, part E, it says, conclude that limb of Xn exists and find the limit. This is a little tricky. The find the limit part. So when it says conclude that, I think what they mean is like explain why it is that you know the limit exists. So as far as this conclusion, I will say lim xn exists because of the monotone convergence theorem, right? Because of, I'll just write MCT, the monotone convergence theorem, colon, xn is increasing that was from part c and bounded that was from part d all right which means by the monotone convergence theorem it does converge it has a limit what about this find the limit um now based on the proof of the monotone convergence theorem the limit is equal to the soup of the term the set of terms but that doesn't actually help you find the limit if you plug these numbers into your calculator you might guess that the limit is 2, although, again, you don't really have a, a good way to prove that. This part is based on a trick that hopefully the people who chose to do this problem remembered this trick so that they could finally seal the deal at the end. The trick is this. The limit of xn is the same as the limit of xn plus 1. What I mean by that is, now that we know the sequence converges, if you take the limit of the sequence starting from the beginning, it must be the same as the limit from this, of the sequence if you just started one position over and then ran the same numbers, right? That this is, uh, this is true of any sequence which converges, or if it diverges, then both would, would diverge. But if the sequence converges, then the limit of xn is the same as the limit of xn plus 1. It's just a matter of shifting your perspective over by 1, but you're looking at the same numbers. Okay? This is the trick. Um, how we use this is we take the definition of the sequence, which is this, xn plus 1 equals square root of 2 plus xn. And this is a very standard trick. So I guess that um, all the people who chose to do this problem on the test, they remembered this trick. Uh, it's, not, it's not very uh, difficult. 
the idea is then take lim everywhere. It says lim xn plus 1 on the left side equals square root 2 plus lim xn. Those two limits are the same. Um, I'm going to say let x equal the limit of xn, which is also equal to lim xn plus 1, right? And so this equation that I wrote there can be rewritten as x equals square root 2 plus x. And that, my friends, can be solved for x. Right? This is an equation now with x as the variable, and we can solve for x. Everybody see how I did that? X is the limit, right? And this thing, we can solve for X. How do we solve for X? I would square on both sides. And then uh, move everything to the same side because this is like a quadratic. I intend to use the quadratic formula or factor. Let's be honest. I want a factor. I don't want to use the quadratic formula unless I have to. But what are the factors here? Any factory masters out there? Yeah, x minus 2 and x plus 1. And so when I break this up, I say x minus 2 equals 0, x plus 1 equals 0, x equal 2, and x equal minus 1. And this is the true solution. x equals 2 is the limit. Why is the other one in there? It's because... Um, this, all this reasoning that I just went through, did not ever use the fact that you start at value uh, plus one. In fact, if you run the same formula but start at value minus one, you'll get minus one every time. And that is also a possible value to limit if you had a different starting point. But you don't have a different starting point. You have the point that we started at. So the limit is x equal two, all right? So hopefully to get to get part E of this one. This was worth only one point out of ten. The whole question was worth 10 points, and this was just one at the end. Um, you had to remember this cute little trick for finding the limit of a recursive sequence. All right, any questions about that? This bit about finding the limit is often quite difficult. In our remaining eight minutes, I wanted to just show you one more example. How about, whoa, I didn't know I could move that want to move that. Okay, how about, um, can I just say another weird sequence that we can show that it converges with the monotone convergence theorem, although it's not obvious at all what the limit is. This, uh, the sequence I'm referring to is like this. The sequence is a n is 1 plus, uh, it's the sum of the reciprocals of the squares, all right? I'm going to demonstrate that this sequence converges. So we'll show that a n converges, well, I'll write the word, because it's not obvious at all what it converges to. but. We're going to show that it converges to something. Um, if I intend to use the monotone convergence theorem, you, there's two parts you've got to demonstrate. First of all, that it's monotone, and second of all, that it's bounded, right? In, in that case, once you have that, then it automatically converges by the theorem. Um, how about monotone? Actually, a n is increasing. It is, really. Does anyone uh, agree with me? You got to think about what happens when you move from one, you know, an versus an plus one. When I say it's increasing, I mean an plus one is always bigger than an. Do you agree? Let me see if I can just write a few terms. A one would just be one. A two is one plus one over two squared, right? A three is one plus one over two squared plus one over three squared. Do you agree this is increasing? It gets bigger every time? 
I think so. I mean, each time you just add on an extra thing. So uh, a n is increasing. Each term adds on something that looks like 1 over n squared or whatever the n is. You just add a new thing at the end every time. So it is increasing. That, that thing that we're adding on is always positive because it's squared. So a n increases every time, right? Okay, what about bounded? To show it's bounded requires a very strange trick. This is not something that um, is obvious to think of, uh, but I hope you won't argue with me when I show you what it looks like. 1 over 2 squared, 1 over 3 squared. I'll write this much. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate that this is always less than or equal to some specific number. This is what, this weird trick, I gotta look at my paper because that's just how weird it is. Oh yeah, it's coming back to me now. So here's what you do. I'm gonna use less than or equal to's and um, you know, uh, eventually get to some constant, that's the idea. So less, this is less than or equal to, uh, I'll leave the one like it is. This I'm gonna write as two times three. And this three squared, I'm gonna write with a three times four. The four squared, I'm gonna write with a four times five. At the end, the n squared, I'm gonna write as an n minus one times n. So what I did was, I, sorry, I think I did it wrong. <laughs> Cause that's, did I do that right? No, I did it. I, I made the num I wanted to make each each of the denominators slightly smaller. Sorry about that. I'm gonna make this a one times two, this a two times three, this a three times four. Should have looked more carefully at my paper. All right. Each denominator has been made um, smaller because I decrease one of the numbers in the denominator, right? Like the first denominator here used to be two times two, I changed to one times two. The denominator is smaller, which means this fraction is now bigger than it used to be, all right? But, okay, why, why did we do that? I'm not done with the, with the weird tricks yet. This, I will invite you to observe, is the same as that. One over two times three, which is one sixth, is the same as one half minus one third. 1 over 3 times 4, which is 1 twelfth, is the same as um, 1 third minus 1 fourth. 1 over n minus 1 times n is the same as 1 over n minus 1 minus 1 over n. Isn't it? It is. This is a, this is a very weird uh, observation to make and not something that, certainly not something that I would come up with on my own, but somebody came up with it. All right. Does anybody see something which can be simplified here? This is the end of the weird tricks. From now on, uh, it's more or less ordinary tricks to, to simplify this. Can you prove all like one minus one over nine? Yeah, uh, sort of all of this stuff cancels. Like for example, what, what happens to this negative one half here? You can add it with this positive one half here. So this guy, can't, whoa. this cancels here, right? It's a minus a half, but then it appears again in the next one with a plus. And the one third also cancels like this. All of these things will cancel, you know, one with the next. What is left over after all of this cancellation? Well, we do have the one at the very beginning and the next one survives. There's nothing to cancel that one. Anything else survives? Yeah, the very last one minus one over n doesn't cancel anything. So this one also does cancel, all right? And then this is, can I say, less than two, isn't it? It's one plus one minus a little something, right? That, that one over n is gonna be very small when the n is big, but it's less than two. Okay, so overall, a n is less than two for all n, right? What I just did, you can do no matter what the n is. And so it is bounded. All right, so 
we showed it's, it's obviously increasing because each term gets a little bit extra added onto it. It's also bounded, and so our conclusion by the monotone convergence theorem, a n converges. And, um, what is the limit? This one is very hard to determine the limit. Anybody seen this example before? 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over n squared. If you do this limit as n goes to infinity, this is actually an example of an infinite series because it's a, it's a sequence, but it, it's a sequence which involves adding things up forever. Uh, actually, this series, I believe, was first computed by Euler, one of the, one of the greats of the you know, European uh, classical mathematicians. Anyone want to guess? Prepare to have your mind blown. It's less than two, right? Because the sequence is bounded by two. It is pi squared over six. How do you like that? Why pi squared over six? I'm not telling. I don't, I, don't, I don't actually, I mean, I've seen the proof of this, but it's not something you really, you can, you can explain in just a few words. It's, a, it's an insane kind of thing that you get pi squared over six from this. Especially like, why would you even think that pi would be part of the answer at all? Knowing, knowing what we know about what pi represents, there's no reason to think that pi should be involved in, in this problem, but turns out it is. All right, that'll do for now. Hope you all have a good weekend.